Thank you very much. Um, as part of being the uh, relocalization movement, there's a lot of pressure amongst us to, to not get on airplanes, to, to keep our footprint down. Um, but I'm trying to make a case for it's okay if there's, if there's a reason behind it. So trying to visualize beyond what happens in the United States to see how we can cut our footprint and respond to uh, climate change and peak oil. So we're gonna, I'll just show a couple pictures from Milwaukee and then we're gonna go to Copenhagen and we're gonna go to a carbon neutral island like, uh, like Randy showed, Samso Island. I'm gonna show the island of Arrow. And there's amazing things that are happening there. So the combination of local activism, as far as you can take it, and then when you think if you come to your limits, um, go look for other cultures that, uh, that you think that are doing better than the United States. Try to vision that with those other people and bring it back to the United States. One of the, I'll only show one picture of myself, and it's like, I feel like a hypocrite if I did not come up here and do everything I could possibly do to cut my footprint. Climate scientists want us to cut our footprint by 80% 80, 80 by 2050, so, and 5.3 billion people do that already on a planet, so it's not that tough. So it is possible to cut your usage by 80%, but it's gonna require some lifestyle changes. Um, the next thing for activism is going is using the power community, and that'll be talked up. This is a urban uh, gardening initiative, a rooftop gardening using earth box techniques. This is something you probably haven't seen before. This is a biofuel collective. A lot of people in this country have a, a reactor in their base <coughs> in their garage. <coughs> we moved it to the to a collective model of 12 people, and we make fuel better than you can buy at a pump and it has a foot carbon footprint, one-tenth of gasoline. After that, moving from 12 or 14 people, you move up to 700 people, and this is a transition church, and Michael uh, will talk about what a transition town is. Trying to transition an entire city of Milwaukee was just too much for me, so I decided to work with 700 people and do a peak oil response here, and I, I can explain what that is later on during the Q&A. So after all that work, <coughs> Is Milwaukee sustainable? No. So I needed a vacation, and I needed to, I wanted to go to, to actually be where the climate summit is going to be, the potentially the most important summit of the history of mankind uh, in a couple weeks from now. So I'm gonna go to, we're gonna take, go to um, Copenhagen first, go down to Arrow. This is the island that uh, Randy was talking about. So of course, when you get off the airplane, you're gonna get on mass transit, electrified mass transit. Then you're gonna get on a bicycle. Because the bicycle culture there is extremely mature. There's bike lanes, uh, amazing. It's the point where they need street lights for this. Stop lights, arrows, and all that. It is a mature culture, um, and there's, it is a very safe place to ride a bicycle. It's so safe that you can take a renewable out on there. The most precious renewable we have is our babies. And one of the things I really liked about being part of Denmark is the seeing firsthand the social safety network that actually works. That baby, from the time it's born to the time it dies, will be taken care of. And it'll be, it will, have educate, will be educated, it will have free health care, it will be an informed, healthy, happy person. This is the happiest, most egalitarian country on the planet. This is childcare, Copenhagen style. So these kids are all over the place, being ridden around in these, in these funky kind of bicycles. This, these kids have a chance of responding to peak oil when they are going to be hit by it. Here in America, the, after they're out of college, they're gonna have so much debt and all these other negative things that happen to our kids. These kids are gonna be way better off. So when we're done talking about babies, we talk about baby vehicles. There's a huge tax on gasoline and a huge tax on vehicles in Denmark. So you drive, tend to drive not much, you drive the smallest thing possible. This is a vineyard, I mean, a, a, somebody delivering wine. So if this was being delivered in an SUV, there would be 180% tax on that if it was a gas guzzler. So if you bought a $27,000 car, in the end, it would cost you $50,000. So that's what keeps these vehicles off the road. And it, it was the, the populace that made those decisions. Here is a destination point in Copenhagen, the Little Mermaid statue. These are German um, uh, tourists there. They're not looking in the background, you can't see it very well, but that's the uh, Middlestadt, uh, Middle, Middle Grunden Wind Cooperative there. 
Um, it was at one time it was the largest cooperative in the in the world. It's been surpassed by some other one, which I don't know what it is, but. Wind is so prevalent in Germany and, and in Denmark that people there really don't care about it so much that they care more about the statue. Um, one thing that got missed on today's talk about feed-in tariffs and, and the promotion of, of wind and, and, elect, and uh, solar is the cooperative model. That is a Vindergold, Vindergild. 50% of those windmills are owned by the people. The other 50% is owned by the, um, the energy generating um, plant. So is Copenhagen sustainable? Is it perfect? No. That was right there in the same harbor. I just turned a different direction. I saw that behemoth there. That is the most unsustainable way of traveling. And, and then so that's just my, my visual is Copenhagen is not perfect. So I'm looking for something that's closer to perfection. Um, Randy talked about uh, Samso. I'm going to talk about this island. This island did not win the competition for islands of carbon neutrality, but it came pretty darn close. This might have came in second or third, and um, it was just the most wonderful place to, to, to spend some time on. It was a vacation for me, but it was also a way for me to, to meditate on sustainability because when you're on an island, you think about the limits of growth. You, you think that, you, you pretend that that island is the earth and there's nothing else and, and you stop pretending that it's, there's an endless horizon. So I stayed on that right there. Marstall has got the largest district heat uh, solar thermal plant on the planet. The windmills are down here. Um, it, the island is virtually carbon neutral for heat, for water in space, and it's 70% uh, neutral for uh, electricity. The, the windmills provide 70% of the, of the island's needs. So this is basically a peak oil island. That, uh, that is 10 kroners per liter, which translates to about $9 a gallon. That, is not, that was not imposed upon them by geology yet, and it was not imposed upon them yet by by the Soviet Union, the, like Cuba. This was imposed upon them on purpose by the populace. So if you price your, your gasoline to that high of a price, you will change your behavior. So as a peak oil island, one of the big things right now for us is, is to be peak oil educators. This is the peak oil educator essentially for the island. He is responsible for 5,000 people. He knows every last person on the island. Every one of you out there has a energy efficiency person that's liaison that's re responsible for your district, but they probably have responsible for 50,000 people or 100,000 people, whatever. This guy has 5,000 people that he's responsible for, so he can meet the needs of everybody. The one thing I wanted to show on here is the sheep, they make the wool and they use it to insulate their walls. And I'll explain why that's important. This is a picture um, of the district heat of air strobing. 600, that meets the needs of 600 houses, it is owned in community by 500 of those households. That is the th two lawnmowers. <laughs> they, uh, they meet the needs of the, you shear them, and they, that it provides the insulation for the houses, and then when they live out their free range life, then you eat them. So they have multiple needs. Now we're gonna go through more sol solar thermal plants. We're gonna slowly progress automatically down to the next thing. We're gonna talk about as you can see, we're going to be talking about wind. Wind, as I mentioned before, is done in a cooperative model, and that got, really didn't get talked about very much this afternoon. 25% of all electricity in, in uh, Denmark is, is provided by windmill guilds. Another 65% is by farmers. In Germany, 33% um, is done in a collective model. That is the power community. It's not, we, we need to talk about more than the, the, the prices of the feed-in tariffs. We need to talk about getting people together to buy these things because people are gonna be less prone to worry about when is it actually gonna meet some monetary cutoff need. People are gonna make ethical decisions because they want green energy. So now we're gonna transition to integrated biomass. Biomass in the foreground, wind there. Biomass is an art form. Biomass from a sense of history. This guy and I talked at length um, about sustainable wood and all that and keeping within the limits of growth. And so it was, it was a wonderful conversation. I really don't have time to talk about it too much, but I'm gonna talk about more modern use of biomass. Biomass again, biomass moved to another location. 
biomass moved to the solar thermal plant. During the summertime, 100% of the water heat is met by the sun. In the winter, um, because it's at a higher latitude about Anchorage, Alaska, um, then you need to augment with uh, uh, burning things. So this used to have an oil burner in it, now, now it burns straw. So all of the heat for this um, little village of 600 um, is met with car is carbon neutral. This is the plant director of that district. And because this island, because th that society feels so safe amongst themselves, there's no barbed wire fence in front, of the, in front of the plant. There wasn't any guards. There wasn't any security system. I just walked in without any, without any invitation. I asked him if, if he would explain how this system worked. And he just didn't kick me out. He just said, absolutely. So then he promptly showed me to the, to the panels and how this works. And I just kind of like, I just looked at it. Like, how often would that happen in the United States? That's district heat. That is um, insulated pipe underneath the ground. Now this is going to the district. And this is um, a 400 year old um, area. In the peak oil world, we have all kinds of the collapse models and zombie responses and all kinds of these ugly things that we possibly could be getting our self into. And as a peak oil responder, educator, we have to try to vision something that's more beautiful. So this is a 400 year old building super insulated because it was gutted. The, the heat is totally sustainable and currently the wind is, 70, the, is providing 70% of electricity. All it needs is one more windmill and it's totally off the grid. So this is what this village looks like from, the, from an aerial view. It, it was just a thing to behold. I stayed there for 10 days and I did not want to leave. If, yes, they, this, this village needs the applause. Um, Anyway, 1777 was the year that this house was built, one year after the Declaration of Independence. It's a beautiful place, built all with sustainable materials. And on the interior, it was gutted once again, efficient wood-burning stove, and a geothermal system. These, this is a farmhouse. On the interior, there's 500 geothermal systems. So if you look at the percentage of geothermal systems in the United States, compared to the, the percentile here, it is night and day. So th this is my final slide. I just wanted to say that after you go around looking at these systems, you, you finally you come back and you talk to the people. I showed some pictures of some of Danish babies. These are Danish women that I talked to when we stayed at the elder hospital together and we shared ideas and we shared how are we possibly going to transition the United States. Everybody was all kind of cool talking with me until I said, I'm trying to, to lower the energy use in, in the United States. They all kind of just kind of gave a pause, like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> because they know how much energy we use. Thank you very much. That's the end of it.